Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello everyone and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick and with me as always is the bona fide hippie of the show, Mackenzie. I'm really not a hippie, honestly. <laughs> I don't know, the 20 minute conversation about climate change that we just had would indicate Okay, but just calling somebody hippie, everybody needs to be, that would mean that everybody needs to be a hippie then. (laughs) I mean, possibly, it depends on what you qualify as a hippie. Um, Point is, damn it, climate change, it sucks. Okay. Um, so today we're starting part one of two parts on none other than John A. Fancy Pants, Mr. McDonald himself, Sir McDonald, no, uh, Sir no less. McDonald. Um, our first prime minister, and hopefully not the f- only prime minister that we actually address. We could probably like make a whole series of discussions like this. Um, We'll talk exactly about how we're actually going to structure this series, uh, not only on McDonald, but just prime ministers mm-hmm. in general. Um, but first, as always, we like to thank our patrons and donors. We actually got a nice donation this week um, from a listener who wished to remain anonymous, but thank you very much. I'm sure you know who you are. Um, And always, we like to thank Craig, Jessica, Elise, and anyone else who wants to sign up on Patreon for $3 a month. You can get access to all our back catalog and the new episodes from the Mac-driven show, Pop Canada. Uh, Our latest episode was on the Malazan Book of the Fallen uh, fantasy series, which was awesome. I really liked our discussion on that. And yeah, you can check it out over on Patreon. Woohoo! Um, okay, so the plan here. Because we were far from being the only people to ever talk about John A. McDonald, or any prime minister from that matter, for that matter, I thought we would be able to do it a bit differently. And we've alluded to it on the show before of how we're going to approach this. If you're looking for a straightforward history of uh, McDonald's premiership, uh, like prime ministership and tenure in Canada, this is not necessarily the show for you. We're forewarning you. There are other shows on Canadian history that have done this. Our friend of the show, Craig, has done a whole series on prime ministers in Canada called From John to Justin, which is good. And... What we're kind of planning today is, like we alluded to, going over a brief overview, in this case of his early life, in the next episode of his later life, and in this episode kind of touching upon what is generally considered to be the positive elements of McDonald's career. It's going to be a short episode, folks. (laughs) Well, like I said before starting recording, It's always kind of a double-edged sword. And I don't say this just with McDonald's. You'll see this with all the prime ministers, where it's like, oh, this interesting thing happened, but it also came with like a heavy baggage as well. So it is very difficult. Think of it like this. This is the textbook episode of McDonald's. We give the overview. We give sort of the things he did regarding consideration, blah, blah, blah. Next week, we're going to, our next episode, we're going to try and dive deeper into the consequences of those actions and the different parts of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like in terms of positive negative, a lot of our negative uh, things next episode are going to be directly related to what we're talking about today. Like it's basically two coin, two sides of the same coin um, in many instances, not all, um, but in many of them. And so, right, it's more of a discussion on his legacy than anything else, right, than a straightforward history. And in terms of culture today, we thought it would be kind of interesting to go through caricatures. Because as Woo-hoo! we mentioned on previous episodes, um, Johnny McDonald was kind of a lightning rod in terms of uh, being cartooned and caricatured in the Canadian media. Um, mostly because he is a funny looking person, right? He's not <laughs> conventionally handsome. Um, and he was around for so long. And his personality in and of itself kind of lends itself to being caricatured. So there's all kinds of things that we can discuss here that are definitely relevant to caricatures. All right, with that kind of overview out of the way, I'll leave it up to you, Mac. How do, like, do you know anything about McDonald's personal life? Like, I know we've talked about before his, like, general legacy and certain things that you are aware of, but do you know anything, like, of the behind the scenes? Uh, not really. Okay. Again, it was never, uh, never a huge thing for me to know about, you know? Mm-hmm. So I don't know so much about the details, background, the history of Johnny McDonald, more just the overall 
image that he projects. Yeah, definitely. Which, as we'll see, is kind of part of Johnny McDonald. Like, yeah. he is very much... Like, that's one of the things that I would argue is his legacy, is how to project that image, right? Um, and we'll kind of develop that a bit later. But you're right. We kind of imagine, I think, in the general sphere of Canadian like culture and politics, we kind of imagine John A. Macdonald is kind of larger than life in many ways, right? A lot of these early prime ministers, actually, we don't tend to think about their personal lives. And a big part of that is because it, like the media scape of the time was very different, mm -hmm. right? Whereas we know a lot about, for example, uh, prime ministers like just uh, like uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who we've mentioned on the show before, they were kind of raised in that, or they were kind of prime ministers during that time when the media was extremely interested in them, right? Where it wasn't necessarily the case back then. Right? So it kind of changes how we imagine them. So like I said, just kind of going over an early life of MacDonald. So he was actually from Scotland um, and he was born in 1815, right? And he actually emigrated to Kingston, Ontario with his entire family. So his, I think he had a brother, a sister and his two parents uh, when he was five in 1820. Now, this is not a particularly rich family. They're not poor either, necessarily. They're kind of like a middle class insofar as a middle class was starting to emerge in the 19th century properly. Um, and they kind of were always in between projects, especially his father. His mother was probably just a stay-at-home mom for a lot of things because that's what women did back then for the most part. Um, but his father was never quite good with money. He was always trying to invest in new uh, projects and it always kind of failed in many ways. Either his partners uh, backed out, his money ran out, he was not very good at a certain thing, or just any other extreme, extraneous circumstances kind of never made him a particularly successful business person and never particularly successful with money. And uh, that's a bit of foreshadowing for John himself um, in terms of dealing with money. So in Kingston, John A. was classically educated. Uh, he, so he learned literature, Latin history, that kind of thing. And he only went to school for about five years. Right? At the time, obligatory education didn't extend necessarily to 16 years old as it is today. And so most of the time, people, especially those of lower ranks or lower class, were basically asked to go to school for less amount of time and just learn in the school of life. The advantage that McDonald had, and we saw this with other people like Joseph Howe, for example, is that he was extremely well-read. Right. He apparently was a voracious reader, and most of his knowledge and his awareness of the world came from the books that he managed to get Any uh, on politics, on history, just fiction. He would apparently read it all. Um, at 15, he would actually begin to work at a local law firm, right? again, not receiving any formal necessarily education in uh, legal terms, but that was the thing at the time you kind of learned through apprenticeship. And so he would start, his, uh, he would work at a local law firm in Kingston and he would open his own office at 19, uh, which, damn, I can't imagine opening my own law office at 19. <laughs> I can barely imagine doing anything at 25. So <laughs> there you go. Um, and he was actually called up to the Law Society of Upper Canada two years later when he was 21. Right. Similar to his father, like I said, McDonald was never particularly great with his finances. Uh, he would actually often do some pro bono work and even the income that he did bring into his law office. The financial aspect of it was never the strongest part. He became like a full-fledged lawyer when he was 21. At 22, however, in 1837, something came to Upper Canada, something that we spent way too many episodes on, the rebellions of 1837, right? Um, and he was actually called to be a militiaman, right? And so it's kind of interesting that he's already directly involved in various sides of the political coin at 22. So he gets the like hands-on approach of military uprisings, right? And he gets the more theoretical approach with law, right? Both of them, it's interesting, you can kind of see it as forming his awareness of needing to compromise, which would kind of inform his entire political career. Right? 
Uh, now, McDonald never actually saw any major combat, right? Uh, he's no, like, valiant hero of the rebellions of 1837. He was present at the well-known attack at Montgomery's Tavern, but as far as anyone can tell, he never, like, was some major standout in the fight. Kind of interesting seeing all these different things, especially something like, oh, but in the law firm, not, you know, you see a lot of McDonald as a self-made man. Absolutely, right? Well, I meant you kind of had to be at the time, mm -hmm. right? Um, or at least, yes and no. There was obviously some nepotism um, that was being done, like the higher you went in terms of uh, political or cultural echelons or economic echelons. But yeah, you definitely had to kind of make your own way and you definitely had more opportunities to do that at the time because it wasn't like a played out market. Yeah, we're also starting to see more of the... What's the word? It's you can see you can see the foundation of why people would be drawn to him. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like there's kind of a jack of all trades sense I'm getting from him, um, or at least willingness to engage with a variety of topics, um, mm -hmm. right? Which can definitely make someone appealing, right? Whether you agree with that person or not. No, it's true. It is, you can you can start to see why he appealed to people at the time and why yeah. people were constantly being like, "Oh, John and McDonald." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the, this guy's got something going on, right? And he knows how to pack a drink. <laughs> McDonald's mom has got it going um, on. So McDonald would actually become a bit more known after the rebellions, right? Still related to the rebellions of 1837, but his law practice and the rebellions themselves would kind of merge because he would actually be called to defend one of the Americans who helped support some of the Upper Canadian and Lower Canadian rebels, right? a man by the name of Niles von Schultz. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's originally from Germany, so I really don't know. Schultz. It's kind of ambiguous why he took the case. It's either out of principle of defending this person who was standing up for something they believed in. It could have been good publicity for what was back then an already early uh, law firm. It hadn't been started that long. Or maybe both. Right? Maybe we both. really have no idea. Right. Um, so yeah, it's one of those mysteries of history that really doesn't matter. The point is, he took the case. Right. And it's kind of interesting because everyone looking back on it now kind of rec recognizes that the Niles von Schultz case was kind of doomed from the start, right? He pleaded guilty to this and he was being, he was set to be hanged for treason. Fine. Right. So what's kind of interesting is that despite this, right, and despite like the, any kind of ability to change much, right, at best he could have attenuated the circumstances of his death, like... McDonald actually spends some time with Von Schultz on the night before his hanging, right? He's noted as having like gone into his cell and just talked to the guy and learn about his life, like why he did the things that he did, why he right. incited rebellion, right? There's obviously like no transcript of this whole discussion. Um, it wasn't like on the record or anything like that, but it, it is kind of interesting that he was actually trying to reach out to Von Schultz despite anything possibly going in his favor, right? And I've quoted from him on the show before, and I'll continue to because he kind of condenses down a lot of uh, the elements that we're talking about here. There's a passage in George A. Bowering's Egotists and Autocrats that kind of sums up what I'm talking about here, which is really interesting. So he talks, he's talking about McDonald's interaction with Von Schultz, where he says, Von Schultz was hopelessly romantic, a noble heart betrayed by the warty dorks around him. He took all responsibility on his shoulders and pleaded guilty and was condemned to hang. MacDonald spent many hours with him at the lockup, hearing all about his family's destruction by the invading Russians and, uh, and about his wanderings through a Europe seething with revolutionary fervor. The young lawyer drew up the hero's will and refused to be named in it. Later, he attended the execution and perhaps was the only person who was troubled in that audience. So a lot of people actually point to this moment, as I kind of alluded to before, as kind of setting the scene for McDonald's entire political career. Mm -hmm. right? Now, there's obviously a lot of debate around this just in terms of historical, like how you conceive of history, because one person is never like fully 
influenced by a single moment, right? Yeah. History is a series of events that kind of coalesce together, right? It's just, a, it's just a bunch of things that just keep happening. Right. Like history is much more random than we like to make, like that we like to think it is, right? And while things interact with one another, the actual like linearness of history is mostly fiction right or, or it's just like an easy way to conceptualize it i feel mm -hmm. but it is kind of it does encapsulate this idea of wanting to be more aware of certain peoples and their background while advancing a certain cause that like mcdonald believed in right so it encapsulates even though you can't i don't think quite specifically say that this moment in particular completely changed his life yep making awesome. sense uh, right around this time would marry his cousin which fun. is always fun to hear <laughs> like i know i know that it was much more common back then but it's still yeah, so weird. Doing it. yeah like it's still so weird to kind of read that out loud and say like oh all right i guess uh, i guess that's a thing so yeah he would marry his cousin isabella clark um actually not long after being elected to the upper canada assembly which we'll be talking about soon uh, unfortunately, she would actually be ill and fall ill almost immediately, and she would basically stay in a mostly, like, vegetative state or, like, non-active state for most of their marriage. She had, like, ups and downs, but she was not, like, a like, healthy person throughout most of their marriage, uh -huh. which is kind of sad. Um, she died in 1857, uh, having given John uh, two sons. One of them died within a year of being born, and the other one, Hugh MacDonald, who was named after MacDonald's own father, would actually grow up to be a politician and premier of Manitoba. So, Ooh. yep, which we might talk about one day, I don't know. Point is, like, he actually, like, survives. <laughs> Um, but that's kind of the name of the game at that time. Not only is childbirth in the best of circumstances an extremely difficult thing, um, but add on top the fact that Isabella was extremely ill for most of her life and could, was mostly bedridden, it's very difficult to actually like mm -hmm. uh, do anything uh, beyond, well, provide comfort and talking to John A, I guess, or like John A comforting her. Mm -hmm. Um, so 10 years later, MacDonald would marry another woman, Susan Agnes, whom, as far as I know, he has no blood relations to, so that's kind of nice. And he would stay with her until his death. Um, she would actually be quite present in the Confederation debates and was known as someone who was quite politically vocal. She would cheer uh, from the stands during the debates. She would actually engage with the other politicians that were uh, mentioned and relevant to the discussions. Um, and I don't think she gets enough, um, I don't think she gets enough cred. <laughs> Just saying, um, that's- um, Oh, I'm kind of surprised she was even allowed in the building at that time. Yeah, I don't know how things like that worked. Because I think, don't know the rules on that. Yeah, I really don't. As far as I know, it might be because of her position as McDonald's wife, or it might be because it was just open to the public, right? And people just kind of accepted it. Mm -hmm. um, I really have no idea. It would be kind of interesting to look into, like, the first ladies of, con or, uh, the, like, the first ladies. I think... I think the, the show that we had, uh, the, the girls that we had on the show not too long ago, Just Watch Me, are actually starting a series on that, on the First Ladies. But um, it would be kind of interesting to go through that as well and to learn more about her role specifically in all this. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like I said, just kind of a brief overview of McDonald's personal life. We'll address a lot of the later stuff in the next episode. Now, on to his politics. Okay. So, MacDonald, part of the Conservative Party, or was he? Uh, MacDonald had actually formed kind of an offshoot of the Conservatives, called the Liberal Conservatives, or what would eventually be called the Progressive Conservatives, which is a party that still exists in parts of Canada today. That would kind of embody his spirit of compromise, right, that we kind of showed through the Niles von Schultz case. Um, and his kind of ability to deal with various aspects because he was not particularly interested in the old walrus mustache kind of Toryism, right? Which is just about pulling up your bootstraps and, you know, full British industrialism away. And he wasn't quite interested in like the full 
uh, free market liberalism that was um, that was being cultivated by the liberals or the reform party at the time. He was kind of a middle ground person, right? Mm -hmm. Personally, in my reading of him, I feel he's a bit more conservative than liberal. So do you know actually anything about like his rise to power as a conservative? Not entirely. I don't know much about anybody's rise to power as a politician, though. I just know when they get in power. Yeah, exactly. But I don't think that's necessarily like uncommon. I don't think people pay much attention to like the many politicians that exist in Canada. I mean, what we have 300 plus, we have over 300 seats in parliament. Like we're not going to pay attention to all of them. Right. And eventually one of them is going to be PM, I guess. So duh. Um, in terms of his actual engagement with the conservative party and conservative politics in general, from his early stages as a lawyer, he was kind of always in the background at the very least. Right? He was organizing meetings, he was carrying messages, he was proposing alliances, right? He was kind of getting up close and personal with a lot of the people that were within the conservative party. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and despite not being actively engaged in, um, in say the direct politics, right. Or the direct meetings, it still put him in people's minds, right. Whenever something needed to be done. Oh, McDonald is, he's there. the man. He'll get it done. Exactly. And plus he's a lawyer. So like if ever anything needed to be drafted or things like that, people knew that he had the ability to do so in a legal way. So I think that kind of starts to show this kind of cunning element that McDonald would be known for of knowing where to put pressure, right? Where to pay attention to, right? right? You can't just burst on the scene and expect people to, to like, uh, accept you with open arms. You kind of have to build up your reputation and build up your ability to get a message across. Right? And I think that kind of shows through here. In 1843, there was an assembly seat that was up for grabs. Now, at the time, we'll remember that the assembly or the legislative assembly was the only part of uh, the two candidates that was actually publicly elected. Uh, the higher office was chosen. And McDonald took his shot, right, in 1843, and he actually succeeded in getting elected in, the, in 1844. Mm -hmm. That being said, he still kind of stayed in the background in those early days. He had established his place, right, but he was kind of a backbencher. He was observing from afar, learning the ropes kind of thing. Um, but again, he would still make these connections, and it's namely there that he would meet the French conservative, Georges-Étienne Cartier, who would kind of become his partner in crime throughout his whole uh, career. An right? Englishman and a Frenchman. There you work. go, right? But again, the spirit of compromise kind of shines through. That being said, there's a lot of, like, I'm trying to focus, again, in the spirit of this episode, to focus on the positive elements of it, but let's face it, he was kind of chummy with Georges and Cartier because Cartier was himself an Anglophile. Man, and well, it's also, it, we can't just talk about positives, you know, like, we're going to we're gonna be talking about both sides of the coin every single moment yep. of this episode. We're just going to choose to focus on certain parts just a little bit more. Exactly, right? Don't worry. Yes, we're going to talk about the treatments of the indigenous and things like that in the next episode. Like, don't, yes. like, that's, that's going to come up. Um, so because of the way that the assembly worked in the province of Canada, we've kind of touched upon this before, you either as a party had to win both Canadas. Uh, you could either stay in a stalemate, right? One party is, one side is conservative, the other liberal, and nothing ever really happens. Mm -hmm. Or you form an alliance, right? And in 1854, as uh, McDonald was kind of working his way up the ladders, the liberals and the conservatives would choose that third option. They would form an alliance, uh, or as we kind of know it today, the Great Coalition. Um, and they would kind of say, okay, well, despite our differences, we'll try to actually do something worthwhile. We'll try to make this. it work. Yeah, right. And as we kind of know, the rest is history. It would lead very much towards confederation, which we just did two full episodes about. Mm -hmm. um, during this time, right, during this 10-year period, during the time that he was first elected to the assembly, and this moment of alliance between liberals and conservatives, McDonald had demonstrated himself to be absolutely phenomenal at politics. He was a charismatic speaker. Um, he was able to understand the many aspects of what was going on. He knew the ins and outs of both the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party. And throughout this time, he worked himself up to receiver general and then to attorney general. And it's in 1856, uh, upon the retirement of the conservative, uh, the head of the conservative party at the time, Alan McNabb, 
he would be able to become joint premier. Um, and he would therefore end up working very directly as the head of, as one of the heads of state uh, with the lower Canada conservatives or liberals, depending on what the elections were, uh, were giving. Now, obviously, I'm going through a lot of stuff here. Like I said, there's other resources that go into much more detail than this. Um, I'm trying to get to the point of his actual legacy here. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, we kind of talked about Confederation for like four hours already. So I'm not going to go over like the ins and outs of it again. But in terms of a broad overview, uh, Macdonald was actually opposed initially to Confederation, right? Uh, he saw wow. it as a path to anarchy and as a move away from Britain. Well, he wasn't wrong. No, exactly. Right. He wasn't wrong. So it's kind of interesting because he's always been, he was always very vocal during his time of like, I am a British subject. And like Britain is the epitome of civilization in his mind. Right. Obviously, like that's not necessarily something that we agree with, but like that's his view. Right. Um, so it, I, from that perspective, I can understand what he means. Right. Not necessarily that it leads to anarchy, but that it definitely leads away from Britain and it leads to some uncertainty. Right. Um, however, two things kind of influenced his move towards accepting confederation. One, he understood that any kind of actual decision-making would have to be done through a completely new organization, right? So as an extension of the great coalition that he had helped form. And two, popular opinion was against him. And so he kind of shifted his tune in this case and be like, all right, well, it's going to happen with or without me. It seems to be going ahead. I'll get on board with it. Fuck mm -hmm. it. <laughs> Fuck you. But like... That's McDonald to a T for me. They're like, all right, I know when I'm wrong, like, or at least I know that I have no ability to change it. So I'll just change my own tune and say that I was always on board with it. <laughs> like, um, but that's just a politician in a nutshell. So in 1867, after the first elections, uh, the first general elections, his party, so the liberal conservatives, would win 100 out of the uh, 180 seats that then formed the House of Commons. So quite the majority. And this is a number that would mostly stick throughout his entire run as prime minister. He would actually lose just one election during his lifetime for reasons that we'll get into. But by and large, like that number, that kind of majority kind of stuck uh, with a bit of variation here and there. Just as an overview of his views, right? I have like five points written down here of like his general views, just to kind of sum it up. He had a very centralized vision of Canada, right? He was not someone who thought much about provincial rights, didn't really care. Um, he thought that it was much more important to provide a British example of a centralized government rather than an American example of states-driven rights. Right? Uh, he supported denominational schools, which again, we'll talk about in later episodes of like French Catholic schools and English Protestant schools as being separate. He's actually supportive of primogeniture, which is, again, it's kind of wild to think as that still being a thing at the time. But for those who don't know, primogeniture is the fact that the eldest son of a family gets access to the will automatically, right? Or access to land, for example, automatically. Huh. So like, yeah, it's the idea of like eldest son gets the first rights. Okay. So that's the usual. Yeah, exactly. But I didn't realize uh, when I was reading up on this, I didn't realize that it had lasted for like this long. Um, oh, it still exists in certain parts. Like it's just, and even if it doesn't have an official title and official law, there's plenty of places that still have that mentality of the firstborn gets certain things. Firstborn son gets even more things. The first mm -hmm. son gets some things. Yeah, exactly. No, uh, I, I, I'm aware of that. I just didn't realize that it was like, still a general part of society like a, a legalized part of society <laughs> uh, i don't know yeah i don't know if it's still still legal part in other places but some people just do it as some people will set it up in their wills you know yes and lastly he saw extremely pragmatic solutions to what he saw as a pragmatic business of governmentality mm -hmm. right in his mind, he didn't want to delve too deeply into theory and like whether something was entirely moral or entirely amoral. Can I do it? And how can I do it? That's pretty much like what drives a lot of his decision making. So as I said, like you can kind of see through all of these examples that he wished to strike a balance between like individualism and market driven rights uh -huh. and more British imperial prerogatives um, and therefore justifying his stance as a liberal conservative. 
anything you wanted to add for this like half hour overview of who McDonald is? Yep. <laughs> yes, you can see why the man became a legend. You know, oh, self self taught, self educated, like a lot of that pulling up by his bootstrap stuff. You can see why people gravitated towards the myth of him. True. Yeah. Because again, only five years in school, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Started his own law firm. Like he is very much the epitome of a self-made man in in, in Canadian version anyway. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. Um, It is kind of interesting. Like, I don't know how much he had that in mind. Uh, Like, I know he definitely cultivated his, his like appearance and all that. And we'll get into, we'll get into that specifically soon, actually. But like I'm I'm genuinely curious. I never looked into it how much he was interested in like providing a legacy that would last, right? Um, because you're right. I can definitely see why the certain things that he did would lead to that. Um, but I don't know how much that was deliberate or not. I'd be kind of curious to look into it. Depending on the historian you read or not. So there's the classic example of Donald Crichton, who wrote a biography of him in the 50s, which is beautifully written, if flawed. Um, he he kind of depicts him as very much this legendary figure, right? Um, And so there is, like, throughout John A. McDonald's history, this kind of understanding of him um, that follows throughout. It's not just a recent thing. So moving on to the actual legacy aspect. Kind of, as we kind of alluded to at the beginning, we're not going to go necessarily in a chronological order here. We're going to touch upon the elements that he did throughout his career and the things he did throughout his career. um, And see kind of how they stand up to the test of time uh Mm. things that are considered a bit more in a positive light by the way the caricatures that we're going to be talking about are all going to be linked in the description so you can actually look at them while we're also doing that so in your mind right when you think of a positive legacy whether it's related to mcdonald or not like how do you imagine that what would broadly speaking a positive legacy be for you besides the whole getting the country together or yeah but like what makes something a positive legacy right oh well i guess if it had a positive impact you know if people were better off afterwards than after the thing than they were before it okay interesting so i mean from that perspective a lot of positive things can also be negative things yeah okay yeah, well, I, well i don't i don't believe that anything is just purely positive or at least not when you're thinking in such big terms I agree, right. If you're thinking in such big terms, there's nothing that's going to be purely positive, you know? There's going to be Mm -hmm. lots of positive, negative, positive, negative. Right. No, I I definitely agree. That's one of the things that I kind of wanted to establish, like, right away. I think the way that we're going to kind of talk about positivity in this sense is within its own context, Mm -hmm. right? Yes, we have our own opinions about certain things, and we have, like, this knowledge um this knowledge of looking back how things actually turned out or what the behind the scenes were but i think it's important in cases like this to kind of think how it actually impacted people in the long run right right? or how people saw it at the time or how mcdonald intended it i think that's all kind of things that have to come into play in this case so for example if we take uh his political stance or like his ability to enact the role of a politician right Mm -hmm. there are definitely some negative sides to how he would act as a politician but it would have an impact i think over the course of canadian history as to how politicians were perceived and in a sense that is a positive legacy right something that people grabbed onto for better or worse right so yes i think that's that's definitely an interesting point that you made so yeah we'll start with actually that like his impact as a political actor um, did you see the caricature for that one? The, yeah, which one is this? What does so it look like? it's the phrenological chart of the head of the country. Oh, I saw. I can't really read it, but I saw it. Yeah. So a lot of them are kind of uh, small to read. Um, you can you can actually zoom in on it if you click on uh, if you click on the image. Yeah, so it's just the reading it like the actual writing, you know. Right. Um, so basically, for those of you who for some reason did not click on the image, it's a sketch of John A. McDonald. And inside his head, it's a bunch of little puzzle pieces, what look like puzzle pieces of various things that he's concerned with. And there's like 20 things in that mind, right? Mm-hmm. What does this kind of, so like, for example, uh, sublimity. So being interested in education and higher purpose. Individuality is one of them. Um, 
uh, acquisitiveness, continuity is another one, inhabitiveness, combativeness. There's all kinds of like different things. There's love in there. And you see him like kissing a representation of Canada in this case. Mm -hmm. Um, So like there's all kinds of things in this case, Uh, benevolence. And you see him giving a bag full of money to a rich industrialist, (laughs) which is very funny. (laughs) Um, So like just based off of that image, Right. How would you kind of describe what, in this case, the artist John Wilson Bengal is describing McDonald as? Like, how would you see this perspective playing out? Of the wait, which is this the map of the head? Yeah. How do I see this playing out? Of why he drew that? Yeah. Like, what does this represent for you? Like, what is he trying to say? McDonald is like complicated, I guess. Again, because I can't really see the different parts of, I can't see if they're ones he's doing is all making fun of him or not. I think some of them he is. Yeah, but it more looks like he's like, to me it just shows there's a very large, there's a large number of facets going on. This is not a simple brain. Yeah. This is not a simple head. Yeah, definitely. I think you can definitely take that like like surface level interpretation of it. Like, yeah. Um, no, no, but like, I don't mean this in a way. Like sometimes caricatures like are exactly that. It's, they're meant to like express a, an immediate message, mm-hmm. right? So yeah, that's something that McDonald is kind of remembered for is being able to play all those facets, right? There's a really interesting anecdote, right? From a book, Crime Ministers in the Media is the name of it. And it kind of says in the first pages, hold on, I'll pull it up here. Here we go. This is literally just the first page of it. And I think it represents what we're talking about here. So he says, at the McGill University convocation in 1873, the governor general, Lord Dufferin, delivered a lengthy speech entirely in Greek. Right? Uh, MacDonald was there with his French Canadian colleague, Hector Langevin. And on the train trip back to Ottawa, Langevin read a news report of the event, which noted that Dufferin had spoken, quote, the purest ancient Greek without mispronouncing a word, end quote. Good heavens, said Langevin to MacDonald. How did the reporter know that? Sir John replied, I told him. But you don't know Greek, exclaimed Langevin. True, answered MacDonald, but I know a little about politics. Wow. Which I love this, um, this entire thing, because it kind of demonstrates that he understood that people prefer a well-told story and a story that's, in, that's engaging, right? That makes sense over the truth, right? And so you require, I think, as Ben Gao is kind of demonstrating here, you require the ability to have all these pieces playing around in your mind at the same time, right? Um, which I think is very uh, indicative, right? I think it's very interesting uh, to think about. Do you see this, like, from your knowledge of Canadian politics, do you see this playing out in other politicians as well, or, or, like, as having an influence from what you understand of Canadian politics, or is this kind of, like, what you expect from politicians? I think it becomes sort of an ideal that we, that Canadian politicians want to be, you want to be like Sir John A. Macdonald, so you want to sort of do what he did, mm-hmm. because, again, like, the dude married his cousin, was touted as an alcoholic, and nobody cared. Absolutely. Right. Nobody cared until it became an issue of national importance, which we'll get into eventually. <laughs> but like, but yeah, I'll agree with you on that. There's a part of me, and I don't know if it's like, if people were directly influenced, as you say, by him or not. But I feel like looking throughout the history of Canadian prime ministers, you kind of see this drive towards thinking that the most charismatic leader is inherently the best. Right. Right. Despite the fact that, like, in terms of policy making and things like that, it's not always the case. Sometimes the quiet ones were extremely effective or, like, extremely good for the country at that time. We just don't remember them because they don't have a rose on their lapel or they're not drunks. Right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's a very, um, I, I can't say for sure if it's an influence, but I can definitely see it as being. Right? Um, Again, pulling from Bowering in this case, there's a little paragraph that he's talking about when this is, I think, in his second mandate, right? Where he says something like, McDonald tried all his familiar tricks, hinting free trade to the free traders, hinting protection to the protectionists, noticing that his old nemesis George Brown was having labor problems at the Globe. He announced that he was interested in making unions legal. But the main issue of this election was going to be the Canadian Pacific Railway, the huge financial gamble for the continental Canada. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and like he goes on to like talk about the, the railway, which we'll talk about soon. Um, but yeah, I think that kind of little passage demonstrates his 
is kind of back and forth and behind the scenes manipulating in many ways. Okay. Unless you had something else to say about his politics that was just kind of opening up, I we can go to like another one that I think is a bit more contentious. Do it. Indigenous populations. Oh, God. So a lot of people listening might be like, hold up, John McDonald did something okay with indigenous populations? Well, um, yeah. 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 kind of. If you look at the caricature for this one, so the one that is extremely racist, because of course it has to be, uh, the one where he's where we see John A. McDonald sitting down with indigenous populations surrounded by teepees <clears throat> and making deals with them. Uh, so this was done around the time that the Electoral Franchise Act was passed, right? So basically, for most of the history of Canada, the people who were allowed to vote were property-owning white males, right? That were above the age of 21 or 21 and older. Right? Okay. Basically, the Electoral Franchise Act made that into law. Right, and actually codified it for Canada. Um, and it namely gave populations like indigenous men the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is kind of interesting because, you know, in 1885, this would have been somewhat unprecedented. Right. And this is why we're talking about like a big but in this case. Right. Because basically they had to fulfill the same responsibilities as a British or a Canadian property owner. Right. And that is to say that they had to own property, even though they were possibly on reserves or reservations. Mm -hmm. And they had to have made at least $150 of changes, which at the time was quite a bit of money, mm -hmm. right? So you can kind of see that, again, this kind of idea of a double-edged sword kind of comes into play here, right? Where you're like, yes, you can have the right to vote, but at what cost, right? Okay. Because like, what's he inciting here? Right. What's like, what would this bring about if people, if like indigenous populations have to follow certain British or Canadian guidelines? Like, what does that incite? About why he, did why the he vote? would do that. Yeah. Well, it encourages them just to sort of assimilate. Yeah. That's I exactly guess. it. That's all he's trying to do. It's just, it's just assimilation dressed up with fancy clothing. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And pretty much like immediately. One of us. One of us. Yeah. It's like, oh, you have to come into the British economic system, right? That is forming here with or without you. Mm -hmm. Either you don't have the right to express yourself on matters of national policy or you die. <laughs> like, or you like become non-Indian, right? <laughs> in their words. So it is kind of a slippery slope, right? A slippery slope. Also, almost immediately, he would kind of limit. Go back the, on it. Yeah, they, they would very much, uh, they, they wouldn't renege on it. It's actually his, one of his successors, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, that would remove that aspect of it. Okay. Um, but he would actually limit it almost immediately to Eastern indigenous populations. Because right around this time, which we we're going to have a whole episode on, is the Northwest Rebellions. So Louis Riel and the Métis population and all those people that are being displaced by the railroad are taking up arms against the Canadian population, or at least the Canadian government. And so mm -hmm. as kind of retribution for that, he removes their right to vote. Right. Um, so it's only Eastern Indigenous populations that have that. Right? So basically it's like five Indigenous people that actually have the, the right to vote when you think about it. <laughs> like once you start tallying at up. It. Yeah. Uh, ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Yeah. So that one, I, I wanted to bring it up because people generally use that as an argument for why John A. McDonald would be a relatively decent politician at times. But I think it kind of ends very quickly as to why that would be the case. Right. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, like I, I brought up a caricature of this one. It's pretty self-explanatory, <laughs> like mostly giving supplies and very material-based things in order for the right to vote. And it comes with so much baggage. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, in this case, you see baggages everywhere. That is it almost worth it, mm -hmm. right? I think this, this caricature is kind of very interesting to bring up and you should definitely look into it and unpack it. But it's pretty straightforward when you think about the wider context that they're playing with here. Mm -hmm. On a kind of related note, right? we had to kind of address the expansion of Canada in this case. Right? Woohoo! So, like, the big... We got bigger! Like, the big daddy of McDonald's project, right? Now, again, this is going to be, like, an ongoing discussion on the show, right? The for ability sure. to, like... Like, we're going to come back to a lot of these. So, for example, the railway itself is going to get its own show. We can't possibly address it just here, right? 
but like I, we do need to actually mention it as something, mm -hmm. right? Um, so in terms of the caricature of this one of Canada's autonomy, it's the McCord Museum one. Um, where you see three men around a baby, all talking about the, how they're the father. Fun. <laughs> yeah, okay, the, the baby. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Right, so again, description time. The baby is like this little chubby baby with a dress, right? Uh, yeah. With a kind of dress, and it says on the dress, Confederation. And you see basically four men around it, including Johnny McDonald. I think the one in the background is Alexander, Alexander Galt. Um, um, I think another one, the, the one on the left is George Brown, and I don't know who the one in the background is, uh, in like the, the middle is. Mm -hmm. But basically, they're all saying, oh, he doesn't even recognize his own father. <laughs> right? Oh, McDonald's, come to me, little baby of confederation. Right, exactly. Um, so it kind of opens up to, it's, it's kind of making fun of the fact that like people imagine McDonald as being like the confederation grand poobah. But obviously there were a bunch of people in this oh, case sure. that were involved in it. Um, so we kind of addressed this in our Confederation episodes, but obviously we're not talking about any kind of full autonomy here, right? McDonald's Canada was one step closer to it, but it was still a mm -hmm. very British country, right? Um, I think this is where we can actually talk about like some of the extra things that McDonald did during his mandate, things that don't warrant necessarily full episodes. Um, so for example, his ability to kind of negotiate with people. So when we're thinking, do you remember, like, obviously we've brought it up a few times, like, do you remember that Joseph Howe was leading the anti-confederation party? Okay. Right. Uh, so he was, he actually got elected not long after Confederation happened. So immediately in the first elections of Confederation, they have to deal with an anti Confederation party that's coming out of Nova Scotia. Of course they do. Exactly. And if you look at the statistics of the time um, in terms of like electoral results, the, the anti-Confederation party would actually succeed in getting, I think, I, if I remember off the top of my head, like 10 or 12 seats in the assembly. <laughs> like They actually managed to get quite a few. Um, and so it's kind of interesting um, to see how this plays out. And during most of his first mandate, basically McDonald would be putting out fires. <laughs> like, how it, that's how it goes. Right, exactly. Like Canada basically starts with a trip. <laughs> like tripping over itself to try to justify Oopsie. its existence <laughs> right but when you think about it like what's happening in 1867-68 nothing <laughs> <laughs> like we're trying to get the railway off the ground trying is a big operative word here yeah. anti-confederation groups already exist Thomas Darcy McGee gets shot in 1868 which like who is one of the driving forces yeah. of confederation and you basically see him trying to negotiate the, uh, the Canada buying off Rupert's land from the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh -huh. Like, that's the major elements that happen during this time. So basically, he's trying to negotiate and compromise with a bunch of people saying like, oh, well, do you, maybe you get this in exchange for that. And, you know, the anti-confederation group led by Howe is kind of emblematic of this, right? Because... Uh -huh he would kind of actually manage to convince Howe that, you know, his anti-confederation party is not going to go anywhere. No, so now you have to work with them. Yeah, exactly. Right. So in part, and this is something that is addressed in Donald Crichton's biography in the first volume, um, he actually does that really well of explaining what the actual negotiations between Howe and MacDonald look like. But one of the major elements is intrinsically related to this kind of expansion westward, right? He kind of convinces um, how to be a part of something much greater than himself and to basically have a slice of the pie that is inevitably going to come with expansion. How true that actually is going to be, right, in the long run is oh. subject to debate. As we've talked about it before, Nova Scotia is kind of forgotten these days um, in the grand scheme of Canada. Yeah, but that's uh, just that discussion. Exactly, right? But at the time, it kind of, you still had this argument in your back pocket of like, you know, you can help build something greater by being the entryway into Canada right, in many ways and like bringing people westward, right? These various settlers from Europe and China. So there, there was that element going on, which I think is kind of interesting. 
Mm -hmm. So like I said before, this is also during the time where Rupert's land would officially pass to Canadian hands. Woohoo! All that land, so much to do with it. Yeah. So much room for activities. Oh, yeah. Um, which I guess we've done something with. Now we have Saskatchewan, I guess. <laughs> like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> woohoo. Yeah, woohoo. Right, but you, you do actually, like, it is interesting also to look at the negotiations of that going on. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, for anyone wondering, it's immediately for purposes of expansion right okay. it, it oh yeah like it's intrinsically a part of the negotiation process is like what are we actually going to do with that land right um once it passes to canadian hands rupert's land becomes known as the northwest territories right in 1870 mm -hmm. and that same year manitoba is formed right um now again we're looking at this from a relatively positive outlook in so far as he's building what we now know as canada or at least as a driving force between what we now know as canada so it leaves a lasting legacy mm -hmm. however we must acknowledge and we will bring that up in its entire episode right that the creation of manitoba and the expansion west like i said will lead to all kinds of problems namely with the Hiel rebellions which would also negatively impact mcdonald's image right um so there's always this like underlying issue going on at the same time <laughs> um so in 1871 so only a year after british columbia would actually join uh under the promise of the railroad being completed so the railroad wouldn't be completed until the decade after right but they're there they're saying like all right well if you promise that by i think it was the end of the decade you get this railroad here um, we'll join we'll up join, here right so we're joining provisionally uh, okay. um so it creates this really weird country in which you have five provinces ontario the maritimes quebec and like a very small and diminutive manitoba it's not the size that it that was we know it of. no no it's it's basically a little square close to the border <laughs> basically like if you look at the map of canada in 1870 it's like manitoba is a little square oh manitoba it's and so manitoba. then on the other side of the country you have british columbia <laughs> and that's canada like at that moment which is kind of very funny uh to think about mm -hmm. There would be also some issues with how the railroad would be completed, which we'll talk about um, in its, uh, again, a full episode here. But that would kind of lead to some renegotiations with British Columbia, say, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of its adherence to confederation. Mm -hmm. And finally, in terms of like the miscellany, Prince Edward Island. It would also join during, uh, this would be actually officially during McDonald's second mandate. Um, oh boy. And, but the, the negotiation processes had started in the first. But Prince Edward Island would join Canada in 1873 uh, because their attempt to make their own train line, as we discussed, just left them completely penniless. Of course it did. Right. Which is indicative of like, what's at stake here, right? When we think about the railway, right mm -hmm. it requires capital right you need money to make this obviously because you need to pay everyone involved and you need to pay the resources and etc cetera, etc cetera. and this is something that canada had a big issue with because canada has no or almost no population so you can't really tax people right right and so where do you find this money nowhere <laughs> well you basically pass it off to private industry right that's um, always a good idea yeah and We'll see how that goes, um, because yeah, it'll. I'll leave that towards the end of the episode, but it kind of like opens up to a whole series of issues, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> um, before that, I want to mention another thing that's kind of. It depends how you look at it, right? right. Um, have you ever heard of the national policy? No, what's national policy? So basically, the national policy was nebulous at best. <laughs> As we'll see, Macdonald is defeated after his, or like, or is forced to resign after his second uh, mand his second tenure, and <laughs> we'll see why. Um, because again, that's very much subject to historical debate. But he's he's kind of forced to resign. He comes back, however, at the end of his uh, at the end of his leave of absence, to put it lightly, and he comes back with this really interesting idea that nobody can quite define. It's called the national policy. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you can see it in the image. The caricature is the one of the elephant with national policy written on it. So basically, it's a big elephant in the room. It's a big idea. Big. Right? Whenever he talks about it, it's like, oh, it'll revitalize Canada. We're in an economic slump now. It's going to be great. Um, we're going to do all this wonderful thing with Canada. And whenever people ask him about it, he's like, yep, it's, uh, it's good for Canada. <laughs> That's all. Basically, like, it, it does vary very much and uh, quite intentionally what exactly falls under the national policy. But by and large, people understand it most comprehensively today as um, basically protectionism, mm -hmm. right? Encouraging national businesses, encouraging, uh, like, high tariffs for American, uh, for American imports, and encouraging Canadian exports your run-of-the-mill kind of protectionist policy. So there was kind of two reasons why he did this. One, because when he left, he was replaced by the liberal Alexander McKenzie, which was a very brief tenure. He only stayed for one mandate. Okay. Right? But it was a tenure that was very much mired with all kinds of problems, his inability to complete the railroad, economic depression. He was unable to negotiate treaties with Britain or America. Um, and... Basically, he was trying to put into place what liberals at the time wanted, right? Much mm -hmm. more free trade with America, um, low tariffs. And this is very much something that McDonald was reacting against. He was like, no, you can't just open borders willy-nilly. Because already at the time, America was a powerhouse of an economy, right? And Canada is minuscule comparatively. So like, especially if we're going to play on the international scale without Britain necessarily breathing down our backs all the time, we can't have these low tariffs. So he's reacting against that. He's also reacting to a variation on this called the Washington Treaty. Uh, or the Treaty of Washington, which happened in 1871, and that MacDonald was a part of signing, but he felt kind of useless, apparently, in that whole process. Uh, he was there as a British commissioner, but he wasn't like didn't very... do much. Yeah, exactly. He was embodying. Well, like it's because uh, he was he he can't really do much because if he tries to assert himself, Canada's being linked to the Britain again, and if but he can't do nothing, so it's like, why am I here? Mm -hmm. It was a lose lose situation for them. Absolutely. So, and also the entire point of the Washington Treaty was basically just ironing out and settling a series of claims that had been left hanging between the United Kingdom and the United States, mm -hmm. right? And so like, oh, you owed me re uh, recompense from the War of 1812 because apparently that's still a fucking thing 60 years later. Um, he, Canadians were trying to get recompense from the Americans from the Fenian raids. Americans were trying to have access to Newfoundland fisheries. Um, all kinds of things going on in that moment. So on top of resolving those issues of compensation, it also gave Americans access to Canada's Atlantic fisheries for 12 years. Right. right? And it basically gave Canada the ability to send fish to America, to sell fish, mm -hmm. um, but, which was basically a huge part of their economy, especially Atlantic Canada was fish. And I think they actually got a lump sum of like $5.5 million or something like that. So economically, it made sense, and it kind of ironed out a lot of political tension that had been kind of left hanging. But politically, it was kind of sketchy, right? So that's why, again, depending on where you stand on this issue of protectionism or free trade and things like that, national policy as a thing can kind of be nebulous, right? Um, for McDonald, at least politically and in his mind economically, it was like, no, we have to like do something against it. And that's where the national policy comes in. Mm -hmm. Right. I think Crichton also at the end of one of his chapters also does that where he very much, he, he doesn't even try to pretend that he's not a huge fan of McDonald, by the way, he's a conservative, he was a conservative historian and he like McDonald was his hero. And he, he writes in one of the chapters where he talks about the Washington treaty, where he mentions upon signing the treaty, accepting the terms, McDonald realized that everything was lost or something like that. Like he really lays it on thick as to how McDonald was feeling at that moment. Um, uh. Like, I don't know how true that is, um, what he's basing himself on. I don't remember, but it, it is em emblematic of how he reacted against it. If you look at it from like a legacy point of view, regardless of where you fall on the issue of protectionism or not, this would actually be central to most Canadian economic policy decisions until World War II. 
cool. like favoring Canadian imports or Canadian productions and the railway and all that, but basically until then. I feel like I've spoken a lot. Do you have anything that you wanted to interject uh, about during this Johnny whole thing? Yeah. About like anything. I feel like I'm just like launching a bunch of information at you. <laughs> I, I don't know. Not much to say, you know? I, there's not, like, these are the comics. I can't really judge them. It's hard to read these old ones. Yeah. I don't some... know about his national policy. Okay. Well, that's why I'm here to just launch information at you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. There's not a lot to comment on. And, you know, it's, it's pretty apparent what the situation is and why he's doing these things. Okay. So just to kind of like wrap it up again, the railway will get its own episode. Oh, it's a whole different topic. It's a whole different topic, but I think it'll kind of lead us nicely into the negative elements of McDonald and like some of the things that we really haven't been addressing, but that have actually been underlying a huge part of the discussions that we've been having here. Mm -hmm. Right. So as we can tell from the caricatures in this case, the goal is to obviously have a railway from Halifax to Vancouver, right? Like one Ooh. massive industrial project. Do it. Um, one of the caricatures is actually interesting where it shows uh, Canada as a woman and, well, what was called then Cousin Jonathan, uh, Jonathan, which was Uncle Sam. Jonathan. Right. I don't know when it changed, like why it was Cousin Jonathan at the time, but that's what they called Uncle Sam. Um, and Miss Canada is saying, see, this is what we want, Cousin Jonathan, pointing to a railway and a train. It will give us real independence and stop the foolish talk about American annexation. I included the American in this case. It's like, that's what they were talking about. I figured. Um, Jonathan replies, well, Miss, I guess you're about right uh, there, but I'll believe it when I see it. So this kind of points to two things. One, the reasoning behind the railway right? Both independence and like being able to do things on your own as a country mm -hmm. and kind of saying like, we're going to stop these Americans before they move northward, which is basically, again, something that's going to plague Canadians as a fear to this very day, <laughs> like in many ways, shapes or forms, not necessarily with territory. And just in terms of like understanding McDonald's role in this, if we want to look at the other caricature, the one where it's basically a guy at a desk with mm -hmm. who's scratching his head so that person at the desk is alexander mckenzie the person who replaced mcdonald for a little bit as the liberal head of government Did you say yeah. my name? Uh, i'm sorry yes <laughs> so like I'll basically on, mckenzie. Uh, on the wall he's kind of like scratching his head and figuring out how to deal with this railway issue right do we pass by america do we go north do we like is it a straight line he during his entire tenure he would never quite figure it out and oh, you see fun. Canada as, again, a woman bringing back a naughty John A. McDonald, <laughs> right? Saying like, all right, he's here to solve the problem again. So this all kinds of points to two things, right? McDonald, again, far from being the only one involved in this thing. Um, he had a whole slew of people. There are like men on the ground that are building the railroad. He's dealing with other politicians who have different opinions as to whether or not um, the railway should be done in a certain way. But it's kind of understood that like McDonald was the driving force for the way it turned out. Like that was kind of his vision in the end that won the day, right? Um, mm -hmm. Plus, because he was prime minister during most of the creation of the railway, he would ultimately have final say in a lot of the decision making, right? So as we mentioned earlier, it's extremely expensive and difficult to build a railway across a continent. <laughs> right? Really? Surprising as it may seem, Right. And you can see that with the failure of Prince Edward Island, trying to entirely subsidize without necessarily getting private contracts in or foreign investment in, and it completely destroyed their economy. So McDonald, along with his peers, kind of realized that, you know, in order to, um, in order to actually make this project a reality, you'd kind of have to require private enterprise mm -hmm. and especially foreign investment. By foreign, we need American. Right. But as we kind of realized throughout this whole presentation is that McDonald doesn't really like Americans. Bum, bum, bum. So there's, again, this kind of political game that's being played here of like, well, I know I need their money, but like for the past decade or so, I've been saying that I hate Americans and their money. So what do I do? Hmm. Nothing. No, <laughs> if only, but no, but that's <laughs> what Alexander McKenzie did was fuck all. But, <laughs> but basically... He went to Montreal rail mogul Hugh Allen in 1872 and was like, look, you have the Canadian Pacific Railway Company, right? But 
you know, I'm not super interested in the fact that you have a lot of American investors. So like, can you make them disappear? Like, can you not? <laughs> and Hugh Allen was like, sure, got you, bro. He basically shuffled some papers around, made them invisible on paper, and then went ahead with the contract, right? But the money was still there. Now, on the other hand, you had another mogul by the name of David McPherson, who was like, hey, I'm a Toronto businessman, and I don't think my uh, interests are being well represented here. So I want a piece of this pie of building the railway, and we can invest together. And it basically created a bit of a back and forth as to who you were prioritizing between Ontario and Quebec and between English and French, which would plague Canada forever. Um, and the solution was to kind of merge the two companies together for this project. Again, this is more easily said than done. Um, McPherson didn't want to be below in terms of decision making than Hugh Allen. There was a lot of dick measuring in terms of who got what. It just part. sounds really like the usual, nothing new, business as usual. That's exactly. But here's the real kicker, and here's where we'll kind of leave off. Oh, fine. Right? It came to be realized that both McPherson and Allen had both had a bigger part to play in the whole affair than anyone had actually realized up until that point. Mm -hmm. Because McPherson, in the past, what a swell guy, had actually paid off a lot of Johnny McDonald's debts. Right? Um. Um, coming back to this whole issue of money problems that McDonald was sometimes having. And it just so happened that Hugh Allen had also been quite a contributor to the Conservative Party platform during the elections. And it just so happened that McDonald, you know, had sent a telegram on not far from the elections um, mm -hmm. saying, I need another $10,000 for my campaign to Hugh Allen. Hugh Allen, who had promptly sent that money and who had basically left the telegram in a safe. A safe that was coincidentally broken into on that night and coincidentally leaked in a liberal newspaper not Jesus. long after. And that whole thing will lead to what is known as the 1873 Pacific Scandal, right? Which <laughs> basically accused McDonald of corruption. Oh, well, yeah. Yep. Oh, shit. Everybody's corrupt. <laughs> he just got caught. But so the, like, that's the whole thing. We'll talk about it more next time when we talk about like the shadier side of McDonald. Mm -hmm. But there's actually a lot of historical contention as to whether or not he was actually aware of what was happening. And a part of that comes with the fact of his heavy drinking. Like that definitely starts to play a part into it of like, he had like patronage, by the way, was a very common thing in politics at the time. It was actually not considered very illegal. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this whole thing of like, oh, what... Like in terms of McDonald actually being a like aware actor, it's kind of sketchy. Uh, but we'll talk about that more next time. To kind of conclude, I'll leave it open to you because again, you didn't really have much time to talk in this case. In this case, what kind of impression does this leave you with for McDonald, like as a person? Um, I didn't talk a lot because I, there was nothing for me to really contribute to, you know? We're going over, again, this is very much the tech book version of McDonald's, so this portrayal very much leaves him as the founding father. Yes. Of all, like, he was complex, but then we, it's not really listing the complexities, but that's the sort of point of this episode, you know, give us the textbook. Right. Give us sort of, like, what we're talking about McDonald's, stuff you can honestly find anywhere. Mm -hmm. Which isn't a knock on you and the research you did, it's more just, like, this is, we needed to do this episode before we get to the meat of the topic next episode. Right, exactly. This is a, and this is, because this has already been a very long episode for us. True. Um, and it's something that I think, like, I, I, and I've mentioned him before, and this is something that I think he does really well, despite, like, really providing a brief overview of ultimately what was a 20 year, 20 odd year career, uh, almost 30 year career. Like, Bowering kind of does this interesting job, and I kind of try to parallel in this case mm -hmm. of balancing the fact that there is an underlying issue with a lot of these. Like, one of the things that he does leading up to the Canadian Pacific scandal is saying like, oh, in tough times, McDonald took a drink and kind of mm -hmm. took the edge off and forgot what was happening at certain times and just kind of went with the flow. And so, and it kind of all leads up to that moment where he's like, what? What kind of, like, what is the scandal? And it kind of like all comes crumbling down onto him, <laughs> um, which I think is like a really interesting narrative way of putting it. So yeah, next episode, we'll talk about not only his later life, 
right, in the introduction, so up until his death. But yeah, again, like the darker side of a lot of these things. It's not necessarily going to be a chronological outlook onto a lot of his career. A lot of these things kind of, I think, mesh together despite not being one after another. But I think, yeah, that's kind of where it'll lead and probably it'll lead us to a bit more of like an active one-on-one -on -one discussion. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention? I don't think so. All right. Do you, to, right. do you want to at least uh, take us away? Take me away. A secret, a secret place. place. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everyone. You can reach out with any questions, comments, or concerns on our Facebook page, and Twitter, and by email. You can support the show to PayPal as a pay what you feel the show is worth and through affiliate links in the recommended reading page that I personally set up. <laughs> you can find perks like extra <laughs> ad-free episodes on Patreon. And as always, this is all optional. We do not, this will remain free and independent as a podcast. But if you do want to find a non-monetary way to support us, please leave a review on iTunes, share with your friends, and just tell us what you think. Spread the word. As Absolutely. Mouth, word of mouth. That's the one. We keep like consistently going up in viewership uh, and listenership by like a dozen or so list followers per week. And so like, please keep it going. Send the reviews. Mm -hmm. It actually does help. So yeah. For now. I wish you all excellent health, and I hope that you're staying safe in these times. See you the next time on Historia Canadiana. Cheers. <laughs>